Hello, I'm Katie Moses, MD and founder of CAM, and I'm delighted to be joined by Daniel Roundtree, who is going to talk with me about the future of socialising. Dan, would you mind introducing yourself to anyone out there taking the time to watch this? Yes, thank you very much, Katie. My name is Daniel Roundtree and I've had two decades in the booze industry. So I've done a few things um, in this space. Um, it's fair to say I've gone narrow and deep in this industry. Um, Majority of my uh, 20 years, I ran uh, an agency that specialised, a marketing agency that specialised in booze marketing, uh, Elastic, that was later acquired by Matthew Clark. But um, in addition to that, I've also run a pub. I had a punch lease for uh, for five years, the old nun's head, um, where I met you. And um, I, I set up Craft Beer Rising now 11 years ago, which evolved into to Brew London. Um, and I've... Um, just completed my last mission in booze, um, which was a founding partner of an accelerator called Ardent Company. And um, yeah, that signals the end of my of, of my career in the booze industry for for some personal reasons. So I'm now on a on a bit of a mission um, to to educate the uh, to educate the world. Uh, maybe let's start with the UK on what might come next. Thank you very much. That's a, a great explanation of what you've done, who you are and, and where you're headed. As you say, we met when you um, ran my local pub, the pub that I got engaged in, the pub that I spent a fair amount of time in um, a few years ago. But now you have been living in L.A. Um, and you have not been drinking. So you've been living this sort of Cali sober lifestyle, as it's called. Um, can you explain what is a Cali sober lifestyle? I will. I will. It's something I was totally not aware of until I got to California, by the way. So this is not was not necessarily a conscious decision. It's something that I've experienced um, for myself and decided to to adopt, I guess. Um, it might be worth starting uh, at the point where we are in the UK and when and sort of how I was feeling when I moved to to the US. I mean, in the UK, we've got CBD and soft drinks. Um, we have, you know, functional mushrooms in, in supplements and Brands that you might be familiar with, um, Three, for example, uh, sorry, Three Spirits um, oh, yes, and, yeah. Yeah, and, and Kin, they have um, adaptogens and nootropics in them that um, propose to affect your body and mind in certain ways um, without right. alcohol. So we're yeah. starting to see that come in, in the UK. And actually, cannabis was made legal for medicinal purposes in the UK in 2018. I don't know many people that carry a canna card but they do exist. I think there's about six to 10,000 of them in circulation in the UK. So I went to the UK, sorry, to the US as a non-drinker, wasn't really interested in cannabis. I knew it was recreational and legal. I don't smoke. So, you know, I didn't really pay it much attention. But what I did find when I uh, arrived in, in California is that um, it was a lot more than just smoking weed. So there was edibles, so gummy. Mm you know, uh, THC, which is the psychoactive substance in, in cannabis, is a, you're able to put it into most things. So it's in cream, it's in um, cookies, crisps, tea, but more, more importantly for us, I think it's, it's, in, it's in drinks. Mm. Um, and, you know, you're starting to see this blurring of, of industries. Mm -hmm. So um, we've seen it a little bit in in the soft drinks and the alcohol industry with alcoholic Mountain Dew, but this kind of blurring of industries where you've got THC brands acting like beer brands, and mm -hmm. you've got um, supplements brands, um, you know, acting like soft drinks brands. This kind of blurring of lots of different lines is is really interesting and, and was fascinating for me. Okay, so the Cali sober lifestyle is about still having that socialization with your friends, still going out, still enjoying yourselves, but not using alcohol as the basis for that. And instead looking to maybe whether it's hallucinogens, whether it's cannabis, whatever it might be, to supplement the already good times that, that you're having. Am I right in that as an assumption? Yeah, there, there is not a uh, an official definition of Cali sober. But what it means is you abstain from alcohol and other addictive substances and you choose THC and psychedelics to alter your mood or your state of mind. Um, okay. If you think about it, it's it's in line with lots of different consumer trends that we're seeing. Mm. You know, 
it, it, it's hand in hand with health and wellness. You know, from a Gen Z perspective, you know, where um, there's been a generation of people in the areas where cannabis is legal that have a dispensary on every corner, as well as they have an off license on every corner. They've got a choice now. It's like, and, um, you know, and if, and if you're not tasting alcohol, um, why would you need a replacement for it? So, you know, it's like, this is, this is a huge conundrum, I think, for um, the very successful non-alcoholic beverages out there. Mm. So tell me, does this, what effect is this having on people, in general, people socialising? So are they going out less? Are they staying at home more? Um, or are they still going out, but they're not having alcohol? What, what, what's your, uh, what have you sort of witnessed whilst you've been there? That's a really good question. I mean, like, I, um, I, I, I mean, again, a lot of this is anecdotal, but, you know, a lot of people are just drinking a lot less, um, you know, and it's not just the younger generation. Uh, our generation and millennials, uh, for example, are abstaining a lot more for lots of different reasons. But um, I do still think people are going out. They're just going out differently. Um, and the experiences that they're going to are different. Um, the non-alc scene in, in LA is slightly different. Um, there are a lot more pop-ups. So um, organizations holding non-alc events in interesting spaces, for example. There are, there, it just, it's going to be different. The experiences are going to be different, you know, and you're gonna to have to, you know, cater for these for these different um, uh, experiences, I believe. And yeah. if, I, if I go back to, you know, some of the, some of the other industries, I believe this is, this is going to affect, you know, um, when you scratch beneath the surface in a new industry um, like cannabis or like psychedelics, you know, it affects everything from, from banking to logistics, to recruitment, to education, to tourism. You know, there is a, there is a, a kind of a, a knock-on effect, a ripple effect of these new industries in pretty much all aspects of business. And of course, whatever happens in the on-trade, you know, there, there's always a, a trade-off, isn't there, between the on-trade and the off-trade. You know, it happens in a different way or, it, you know, it emerges in a different way. But does that mean that we're going to be seeing mushroom chocolates replacing after eight mints after my dinner parties? Uh, look, the, the, sh the short answer is, is yes. I think you are. Um, look, you're no one in LA unless you're microdosing something. Now, look, this is a like a like a term that's that's now been adopted for microdosing caffeine, for microdosing CBD, for microdosing supplements. So, look, I'm I'm not saying that you are going to uh, be be seeing that happen in terms of microdosing commonplace in the next, say, five years in the UK. But yeah, look, in, in the US, it very much is the case after dinner, you are being offered psilocybin chocolate, THC chocolate, you know, and that's, this is the other massively fascinating thing for me is was the grey market. So, you know, yeah. even though it's illegal at a federal level, um, you know, cannabis is still illegal at a federal level, and so are psychedelics. There are many people acting as though it isn't. You know, very, very sophisticated FMCG, CPG brands out there that, you know, utilizing, you know, direct to consumer, um, you know, methods of sending via the post, basically. Um, you can access gummies and uh, a chocolate, you know, pretty readily. And with the use of social media and Web 3.0, it's making it very easy for people to act illegally. But because it's decriminalized, people just are doing it anyway. Yeah. I've not been to California in a while, but I have been to Austin and also New York in the last few months um, um, and, tech, and um, Vegas, actually. And in all three places, this was something I was seeing. You know, like you say, the stores are popping up everywhere. It doesn't seem to be a taboo to be participating in, in that kind of category. Um, what I guess my worry, being a massive lover of pubs, whether that's to drink alcohol in or not, um, and bars and restaurants you can't have a cannabis license and an alcohol license as I believe. So what does that mean um, for the possibly the future of our on trade venues? If, as we are seeing, this does start to, to migrate to the UK. It's a, it's a really good question. Um, yeah. You can't have a cannabis license and a, uh, an alcohol license. That is, that is true. In fact, um, one of the last things I did in uh, when I left Los Angeles was to visit a, um, a cannabis lounge. These are popping up 
um, in in Los Angeles, and this is one called The Woods, which was um, set up by Woody Harrelson, um, who is a big cannabis campaigner. Um, and it's it's amazing. It's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Like yeah. retail experience that you walk through. Um, it could be could be Harrods, but for for cannabis, and you walk through the back, and there's there's um, there's lockers to put your cannabis in, and you go out the back, and there's a bar, but that bar mm -hmm. has no alcohol in it, and it's all um, you know THC infused drinks. Okay. Um, you've got very sophisticated brands that are replacing um, the uh, the need of alcohol. So I go back to kind of the blurring of lines. You've got uh, you know cans that will replace your beer, and you've got very sophisticated spirit looking THC that will replace aperitifs, for example. So some some brands to potentially look out for are Tet, Pamos. Uh, Can Wink, Uncle Arnie's, Hi-Fi. These brands are are you know are going to look like um, our back bars doing these in the so. And it's look. fascinating because it seems to to be, uh, you know, obviously you're a marketing guru mm -hmm. yourself, but, and it seems to be like the marketing and the effort that's going into the design and the naming of these. You know, this is not. Um, you know, stack them high and sell it low. This is, we want to create long lasting, interesting, cool brands. That's kind of what I'm seeing. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Look, I mean, there was a massive gold rush like a decade ago and people rushed product to market. Uh, things, have, things have settled down a, a huge amount. And yeah, you can see that there's some very sophisticated brands playing to, um, you know, niches and going narrow and deep and, you know, doing the things that we know are, uh, you know, are really important for for uh, I guess you know lifestyle brands you know in the boost space or in or in other industries. So yeah, really sophisticated brands and they're getting some serious investment. They're on you know they're on billboards and you know NBA players as of April this year are, are able to endorse and um, and even own cannabis companies. And you know if if an NBA player has um, cannabis in their system after a drugs test, that's okay. So, you know, you can see how this is, is changing into the consciousness of, yeah. um, of, of the wider, uh, wider kind of a yeah. environment and society. So, you know, socially acceptable, definitely. You know, 30%, I believe, of, of Americans are, are using cannabis recreationally. Okay. And that's, I mean, that's a massive statistic. I don't know what that is in the UK, but I know that it's nowhere near that. I, and actually, it just reminded me, when about five years ago, um, my husband and I, we uh, hired a um, RV and we went around California for a month. Um, it was about, yeah, about five years ago. And we ended up in Sonoma, obviously wine, wine country. Um, and unlike you, I do still like a, a glass of wine, which was lovely. But we went to Francis Ford Coppola's vineyard. Um, which was incredibly interesting. And he's got the original Godfather desk in the main area and everything else. And, you know, it was brilliant. But the thing that really struck me is that alongside the, um, the, the alcohol that he was doing, the wine, he was also just launching a cannabis brand, um, which I thought was fascinating. So you've got this, this crossover there. So, you know, taking Francis Ford Coppola as, a, as an example Will we see brands doing both? Will we see, because obviously the booze companies have traditionally been incredibly good at um, being, in, being where the zeitgeist is um, and, and being able to do something interesting. And of course they've got deep pockets, they've got you know, money and talent and skill and reach um, about them. So will we see some mix-ups, some match-ups, do you think? Yeah, we already are. If you if you if you follow the money, um, Constellation have made a big play um, in terms of investment in in this space. Um, I think they might have even divested some elements recently, but they went they went pretty big into into the cannabis space. Um, you know, Heineken, for example, Lagunitas do a do a, a THC beer. Pabst Blue Ribbon do a pit THC beer. Mm -hmm. The research I can tell, um, Pernod Ricard have a joint venture or, or have invested in 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 a uh, cannabis beverage uh, business. It'll be, it'll be on, on the uh, boardrooms of all of these businesses um, as an opportunity or a threat or both, who knows? Um, but you can't ignore it. And, you know, we're talking a lot about um, THC, but psychedelics are equally as, as interesting and as prevalent as, as THC in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the States at the moment. 
Okay, well, I mean, obviously, we can't comment on the legalities and the obviously there'll be some harm reduction conversations that are going on, etc. So I want to finish off by asking you um, to give us a few predictions, taking into consideration where you've traveled. I know you're in Mexico at the moment. You've obviously just been around the US um, and some of the things that we've already discussed that I've seen. What are you predicting that, that the UK public... Um, the drinks industry, the low and no industry and the operators, what should we be looking out for? What should we be expecting? Okay, I mean, I, the, the big big numbers, you know, speak for themselves. You know, the alcohol market globally is absolutely massive, 3.6 trillion and globally. And the alcohol, sorry, the cannabis industry is only at 60 billion, you know. So we're... It's, 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 60 billion, you know, that's not... Yeah, it's, it's, right. it's, I mean, it's, and so I, I do predict one going one way and one going the other. I do, I do predict, you know, the alcohol market growing at a very slow CAGA, potentially 2% over the next, next 10 years. And, and maybe, and maybe psychedelics and THC are growing at something more like 15 to 20%. So they're, they're the big, big numbers. And then you've got a whole generation of, you know, Gen Z turning, turning to more, um, more socially accepted mood altering substances like psychedelics and THC um, that help their lifestyle. This is the mm. most important thing. So I think with that as kind of context, there's, I'm going to make some, you know, some predictions that um, right. that some of them are, some of them people will like, some of them will think mm. are a bit silly, but I think uh, we should consider them because this is serious. Yeah. It's, it's coming down the line. Yeah. Okay. So I believe that, for the Gen Z, the Generation Z, um, the socially acceptable mood altering substances will not be alcohol where cannabis and THC is legal. Okay. Um, and I also believe that millennials um, mm -hmm. will become the quitting generation. So by 2027, 30% of millennials will not drink. Okay, so I'm a millennial, so I need to decide what side I want to be on. I think I might wait to see what comes over instead so that I don't have to actually be alone with my actual thoughts. So, okay, any more predictions? Yeah, so within five years, recreational cannabis will be legal in the UK. So how's this going to affect the on-trade? That's another thing for, because I don't, you know, we won't be able to have, a, you know, a cannabis section at the back of a pub. So, you know, how's that going to affect things? Um I also believe that microdosing, LSD and psilocybin will be commonplace in the UK in the next five years. So how will that affect HR policies? You know, will you allow people to microdose at work? Um, so I, I predict that Gen Z, Generation Z, um, will be having stag do's to psilocybin retreats rather than um, weekends in Blackpool, Brighton, Newquay and Ibiza. So how's that going well, to affect? are available. Oh my God, well, I would be very happy for that because there's nothing I hate more in the world. Well, there's a few things, but Hindus is just... Mm -mm. Yeah. Okay, I, I predict that um, within 10 years, um, Nick Jones will start a chain of private cannabis and psychedelic lounges that will float on the Lon London Stock Exchange. Okay, and what? And what, well, I'm going to get thinking now for a really good name for this. Yeah. I think that that's a that's a great idea. And Nick, if you're watching, if you do happen to come across a, a copy of this interview, please let us know if it's on the cards. We'd much appreciate it. And and my my probably very outlandish, far out one is that in 20 years' time, Diageo will announce a mandate to become totally alcohol free by 2050. So it almost going the same way as the cigarette companies have gone. Like Philip Morris is just, you know, piling everything they've got into vaping and saying that's where they want to, to spend their, their time and energy now. So you think that it will almost become as socially unacceptable to drink alcohol and end up in a gutter outside Mr. Cod in Reading after a night out with your girlfriends. I don't know where I came up with that little story from. <laughs> um, do you think that that will become as socially unacceptable as smoking has, has pretty much become in the UK now? Yeah, look, it will affect all, all kind of socialising experiences um, for, for everyone, really. I also believe that we will be attending festivals where there's no alcohol. Uh, the bars are all... Um, full of the beautiful non-alc, um, uh, you know, uh, substances now available. Yeah. And there will be a cannabis license and mm -hmm. potentially the ability to indulge in psychedelics in a uh, safe environment. Um, yeah. So I think it's going to affect festivals. But in fact, 
I was speaking to um, someone that works for Live Nation and next year they are um, foregoing some of their alcohol licenses in the US for cannabis licenses. So mm -hmm. it's a big trial that's happening in, yeah. you know, in Coachella this year. First partnership with a non-alc business called The New Bar, which was hugely popular. So, you know, the Generation Z are driving this um, yeah. and, you know, they're not yet up to key spending um, power of the millennials, but they will be soon. So they will yeah. be influencing a lot of this. Brilliant. Wow. Dan, thank you. All, awesome to catch up, but but really good to... I've got quite a good understanding now. I mean, we've been talking about this for some time and, and I think, you know, obviously there's a smile on my face because we're talking about hallucinogens, hallucinogenics, we're talking about THC, we're talking about alcohol, but actually it's quite a serious um, thing that we need to be discussing and getting ready for in the UK. And I think that, the again, as with anything, the early bird catches the worm, it will be the early adopters that really do well from, from the trend. And as we always say, if America sneezes, the UK catches a cold. Um, so what is going on over there is likely to um, arrive here at some point. Thank you. Thank you for educating me. Thank you for putting up with my, my stupid questions. Um, and thank you for being no an awesome landlord back in the day. No, no, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Thanks, Katie. Uh, thank you.